Hey coach, well, I'm so happy you found us on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe, hit the bell up above. We put out content just about every day. Also, go down below and check out teachhoops.com for coaches who want to get better. If you're looking to become a better basketball coach, you're looking for a mentor, if you're looking for resources, teachhoops.com is the answer for you. Go over and check it out and have a great day. All right, welcome, welcome, welcome to Coach Unplugged. I believe I'm at episode... I'm over 1,700, if you can believe that. Um, yeah, wow. Anyway, uh, that's a lot. And I'm still married. It's crazy. Um, I bought her Chipotle, so she's happy. She's somewhere. When my dog bought my daughter and her Chipotle. Um, so, Matt, I'm going to have you kind of introduce yourself and tell the people a little bit about your basketball journey, and then we'll get to where you are now. And then, um, but just I'm going to turn it over to you and just kind of because I always like this as a listener of other podcasts. I want to know who I'm listening to and where they're coming from and kind of their their basketball journey and anything you want to share on that. I will, like I said, before we went on the air, I'll jump in and, and we'll just take it from there. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Sure. Well, my name is Matt Kittner. Um, I am currently, I'm going to start where I am and then go all the way back. Currently an assistant men's basketball coach at the college of New Jersey, TCNJ. Okay. Um, So I'm going to stop that. I let him in 30 seconds, listeners. Mm. Tell people where that is, what division it is. Sure. It's not a. It's not a one that at least in a Midwest school, in the Midwestern, or where know where it is or any of that kind of stuff. No, we're we're located uh, in Ewing, New Jersey, which is right outside of Trenton. We're in the middle of the state of New Jersey. We're we're close to Princeton University. We are a high academic division three, and we compete in a conference called the NJAC, which is comprised of all New Jersey State Division three athletic schools. Really? Okay. Yeah. So you've heard of the WEAC then? hundred percent. Absolutely. <laughs> and my son goes to Middlebury. You've heard of the NASDAQ. I have. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Perfect. So if we, so, so, I'm just making sure, cause I will refer <laughs> to them from time to time. Yeah. Have yeah. you have heard of both of them? Per, per, yeah. Pretty good conferences. Both of them pretty good. Indeed. Well, Midwest basketball. Absolutely. Very good. Especially with D3. Yeah. Very good. Uh, we don't, you know why we don't have any D2s. We have one. That's, we have that's what I, yeah. That's what I've, uh, been told so yeah they all and the minnesota has a bunch of them so we lose a lot of our kids to the the mm. minnesota ones um mm. or they go south too sometimes um all right so go back and let's i want to hear about how you got to that to that right school. so um it, as soon as i played basketball i started playing basketball nine or ten years old um i i fell in love it wasn't really a mystery to me about that but i'm from a very very small town right outside of new york city on the jersey side called Bogota, new jersey Um, For anybody familiar with New Jersey, it's in Bergen County, located near the George Washington Bridge. So I went to a really small public high school, graduated class, like 75 kids, but it was a very rich sports history at the school. My high school- So hold on, so hold on. So I I kind of, my brother has a place in New York. So how far, like you jump on, how how far can you get, how long to get to Manhattan or the, or where the trade centers were and stuff? Well, I would, with no traffic, so I would have to leave on a random night at like 2 a.m. or something, no traffic in Manhattan, but it would take me about like 10 minutes, maybe. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm right by, I'm, I'm very close to Fort Lee, which is the town that connects New York City and New Jersey. It's what connects to George Washington. Okay, yep, yep, so yep. Real I'm close to that, that area. Um, and North Jersey is a hotbed of basketball. So even though I was from a small town, my high school, I grew up around incredible basketball and played for a New Jersey legend high school coach who has since retired with, uh, I, I think, what did he get to like 700? If I messed that up, sorry, Coach Mahoney. I'm, I'm, yeah, <laughs> um, and I had a good high school career. I was unrecruited. Um, I went to a small division three college in New Jersey called Fairleigh Dickinson University, Florham. For those that have heard of FDU, uh, there are two. There was the one that got national notoriety during the NCAA tournament. There's a sister school that is still affiliated. Um, that's a Division three school. And I uh, went there. I did not play in my freshman year. You should just tell people you go to – you should you should skip well, that when you I'm tell gonna, people. I'm going to get to – I got I to gotta get uh, to the last part of my story. So um, I went there. I played my freshman year. I actually had surgery on my shoulder my freshman year, uh, and I was unrecruited, but I was stayed in shape and connected with the basketball team and ultimately walked on in my sophomore year. Um, had a, a decent two-year career. I became a starter for a period of time, became a rotational player, uh, which was me out kicking my coverage 
uh, as far as I was concerned as a walk-on. And I loved playing. I really fell in love with learning more aspects of the game. Scouting reports were new to me. Um, I came from an old, old school high school coach who taught me how to be tough and play defense and, you know, be confident and all that. But he would admit, like, we were learning that. We weren't going into the X's and O's as much. So by my senior year, I was no longer playing. I transferred over and graduated from the other FDU, uh, which is close to my hometown. It was, it was like a, a mile away. So I lived at home, and that started my coaching career. I went to that high school that I played at and graduated from, and I became the freshman boys coach during my senior year of college, and I was an assistant on the varsity staff. Um, and then the next year, I learned how much I loved basketball by going to law school for a year and learning that that was not what I wanted to do. And that I Amen. missed Amen. There's enough lawyers. Amen. Yeah. yeah. My, my father does that. Um, but I knew I didn't want to be around the game. I don't want to host. So I became a high school coach, substitute teacher, working in education in some capacity. And I was um, Coach Mahoney's JV coach, associate head coach, whatever you want to call it. It was it was a, a staff along with Mike Searles. I'm going to shout him out just in case he ever listens to this. Another great assistant teammate of mine. And I learned from a legend. And he gave me so much freedom to give input and to run my team and to help him and coach some varsity games when he couldn't, um, that I got to a point where I knew I wanted to make it a career. And he was the first person that told me, like, you clearly don't want to be a teacher. And if you want to make basketball a career, it's at the college level. Um, so I spent a summer uh, applying to everything on hoop dirt. And uh, eventually one place called me back, which was Penn State University Abington, which is right outside of Philadelphia. It's a Division three school that now competes in the United East Conference. And at the time, the head coach was John Tanuz. Hey, so before we jump in, first, a couple of things. Make, make sure you stay close to the mic because we lost you a little bit there. I'm not going to re-edit it out. So if people are listening, whatever. I just leave it. I don't have enough time to edit all that out. But um, so how many – I want to go back to your application process. Um, how many do you think you applied to? 60 to 70. And you just – if it was open, you just applied. If it was Duke or if it was a college in Tennessee or something, it was getting an application from me for sure. That's crazy. I, I don't know if you've ever, that's the, that's like Buzz Williams, man. That's like, I, I tell you want it bad enough. You just keep going. You grind. It's like being an actor. You yeah, I was, grind. there was, I, I felt like all of them were equally as unattainable in my mind. So why not? Like if, if I don't have it now, I can't lose it. So right. I can only gain it if I try to get it. And the only advice that I was getting from people that I could talk to that were in the industry or whatever was, you got to be a little bit crazy uh, to do this anyway. And I was like, well, I'm going to be a lot of bit crazy then. Right. I'm gonna try this. Um, so Penn State Abington that summer, at least, was the only college that called me back. And it was for the assistant coach position. And it was the, the head coach at the time. His name was John Tanous. Um, He called me back and the phone conversation went well. And he invited me to campus and the campus visit went well and he offered me the position. Uh, and I remember in the interview, uh, him asking me like, you know, the job only paid $4,000. So like, do you, do you have another job? Like, do you have a job? Do you have a place to live? And I told him yes to both things, even though I did not. Uh, but I was close enough to the Philadelphia area that I was already applying the jobs and I just, figured I would figure it out. And if I didn't, then I wouldn't be able to get the job. Right. And I tell people at the D3 level, there aren't the rules. Like if you really no. want to do it, like I could walk down the street and volunteer to a D3 job. Like yes. obviously with my resume, I could do it. But if you trust me, they'll take the body. If, and then yeah. you can earn your, you can earn your keep. If you, I mean, they don't have yep. like, there's only so many guys that can sit on a bench at a D1 school. There's rules once you get mm -hmm. up to that level. But D3, I think they can have it. 20 it doesn't matter i don't think yeah it's like, a really what would restrict them is the budget like how many yeah. people are eating how, you know how many how many uh, meals and and uh, hotel rooms do we need right. so right yeah there's there's a lot of uh, a different approach to it but it was a small staff so when i got brought on it was um it was the head coach myself and another assistant named mike evans and, and it was us three and we were doing our thing and that was my introduction into everything college basketball into recruiting into scouting, into watching film and breaking it down. 
um, the lack of player development at D3 compared to high school. I was used to doing everything with the boys in the in the off season and in the summer, getting in the gym with them. And Division three has restrictions on that. So I had to learn a new way to go about you know my days and about my life. But I still was absolutely in love with it and felt like in the beginning there was a little imposter syndrome, but it dissipated quickly because I was just enjoying what I was doing. Uh, right. And from that yeah. point. I knew I wanted to continue and try to grow in the industry. Um, and I spoke to as many people as I could, worked as many camps as I could, and eventually got the opportunity, which leads me to where I am now. Hey, what, so talk about the camp Talk about the camp thing. What, what did the camp thing do to, for you? So in my area, at least, um, an example, I'll, I'll name Hoop Group as a um, business that runs a lot of different exposure camps, summer camps, at least camps, you name it. And what it did for me, in the very least, was it made other people within my industry, other college coaches, aware of my existence. Because I would work those, those camps, and that was a networking opportunity for me, in addition to a recruiting opportunity for me, if you treat it as such. Um, and I was eager, and I can be social at times, and I was most social during times when I felt like it would, it would actually help me. And there's also what I ended up learning are there are a lot of wonderful, great people that are coaches. And it's no wonder that I loved coaches that I played for because some of these people are now my friends and they are competitors of mine during the season. But I also look at a lot of these camps as my opportunity to go just spend time with people that I enjoy being around. And those genuine relationships, as in any other industry, they can lead to job opportunities. Uh, and they can lead to a lot of other things. As well. I'm telling you, man. I'm, I'm, I, I, it's all about like life is about connections yeah. and whether it's fair or not, it is. I mean, I just, the more, the older I get, the more and more it's like, well, this person got this job. I mean, because he knew this and it's like all these, you know, if, if you're an actor, you, you roomed with this person and then they got a gig and then you got a gig. And it's like, it's the same thing. And it's a, and coaching is such a trust thing. That yeah. if I'm putting you on my staff and I'm a D2 or D1 coach, even a D3 coach, I got to make sure you're following the freaking rules because I ain't losing my job because you cheated or you made a mistake. or So there's a built of trust. And if I've spent enough time around you, I hopefully I can do character. Yeah, I I don't think the young enough young coaches do that networking. They just want to get the job. I mean, it's yeah. it's a what I always look at it as. And it's again, it's advice that I would get from people that were helping me is that assistant that you're that other assistant coach that you're working with at that camp they might be about to get a head coaching job and they might have a really good assistant position available if you demonstrate your best self when you're at camp with them and you're working your butt off and you're really engaging with the players and you're not just going through the motions or complaining about how long the day is or whatever it may be if you don't treat it like a grind but if you treat each of it, each of those opportunities as an opportunity, then the right person might notice that. And they're going to remember you for that. You get an op you get the opportunity to shape your reputation based on your attitude, based on your work ethic. And I know, especially younger me, this is however many years ago, six years ago now, when I had a little bit more energy, some of those days I was really going crazy. I was really just trying to do absolutely everything that I could at that camp. So that no matter what, they knew my name and they would invite me back. Because right. if I right. can keep going and I can keep showing up, now people recognize me. And now there are more connections and a reputation that's positive. Right. Yeah. So how did, the, how did the job end up? And how long have you been there? And how did you get the job you're in right now? I just finished. I, I stayed three seasons at, at Penn State Abington. The last season that I was there was 2019-2020. So our season, we did we made the conference tournament but we did not make the NCAA tournament that year. So our season was over before COVID hit, but it also, as it affected everybody else, there was a big unknown when COVID hit, if we would have a basketball team the next year, if the season would happen. Um, and fortunately at the time, uh, my, my boss at the time, John Tanous, he was a big advocate of mine of trying to find a, a different job. He knew I was from New Jersey um, and a friend of mine made me aware of the opening at where I'm at now, TCNJ. I knew I had contacted that head coach in the past about a uh, position. My current boss, Matt Goldsmith, who's a tremendous head coach. Um, and we connected during COVID. It was November of 2020. 
And I spoke on the phone with him and uh, interviewed with him over the course of a couple of weeks. It was a different, you know, way to do things back then. And when he gave me the uh, the offer to be the assistant, there was no hesitation. I was really excited to go to a high academic division three, which was a place that I always or uh, an area of college basketball I always wanted to be in, and to go back to New Jersey and and to to recruit my state uh, and have a lot of pride in that. And that was something that was a a wonderful opportunity for me. They were coming off of a conference championship season as well. So tell me about, so, so let's say I'm a coach in, I don't know, and, and I've met you and I'm a head coach in, uh, you know, I don't know, I'm going to pick a like Tennessee something. I don't know somewhere. Mm-hmm. So you, I, I would assume as assistant, you have to bring something to the table, like an expertise. Like if I'm in Tennessee, you're going to be my East coast guy. Like you better know the East coast in and out. Because when I bring you in, I already got a West Coast guy, and I already got—I don't know how does—is that the way it works? Absolutely, it's—it's it's, man, it ties back to what we were just talking about, right? Like the strength of your network, the strength of the relationships that you have. In my world, and where I'm at, we're a state school, so we focus on the state, and that's a benefit to us. Right. But it's a competitive state, and there's a lot of other state schools, so we're still recruiting against. Pennsylvania, which is very close to New Jersey, New York, which is very close to New Jersey, and then everything within the state of New Jersey, as well as, as I said, you know, we're, we're a high academic college. We recruit uh, against the Ivy and the Patriots sometimes because the Ivy is not a scholarship type of situation, so it's a little different. But for me, where I felt like I could provide value to Coach Goldsmith and to TCNJ, and ultimately I guess he agreed, is I do have a lot of contacts. In New Jersey, I was a high school coach in the state for six years. I played basketball in the state. Um, I know AAU coaches within the state. Being able to tap into those different networks, but more than anything, and I think even the coach even told me this, is I didn't pretend to have a bigger network than I had. What I told him was, I will drive anywhere and everywhere in the state, wherever I need to be. I'm not going to miss, or I'm not, there's no rock that I'm not going to be willing to turn over. So even if I don't have the network yet, watch how quickly I can build it if given the opportunity and that being my primary focus. Yeah, I love that. I love that. You know, people, sometimes it's easier to to be like a little Ivy or your school or an Ivy or a state because you can eliminate 75% (laughs) of the uh, basketball players. Like, (laughs) I can't look, I can't look at you. Like, sorry, you're a two point. You got a a 21 on the ACT. I sorry. You could, you could be LeBron. I can't look at you because you ain't getting in. Like, I, it's, a, it's 100% accurate. It becomes uh, sometimes very disappointing when, right. when we are at an event and we see somebody and, and fall in basketball lust. And then the first question, and, you know, this is something, it's a classic line. I remember hearing it when I was sitting at Five Star and Pocono Invitation. And coaches would say, first thing I'm going to ask your high school coach is, what are your grades? And I remember rolling my eyes like, no, you're not. If somebody's in here 360 dunking, then you're not going to ask that. And now here I am reaching out to these coaches. Hey, coach, can I get a copy of his transcript? Right. What's his right. Yeah. Yep. And yep. so so it basically it's all the same people recruiting the same kid because there's only so there's only so many of them. There are some hidden gems once in a while, but there are only so many. There's you know? a reason that those college assistants are my friends. We see right. each other so often. We're in the same gyms. I can almost predict when I'm going to watch a certain high school player. Oh, I'm going to see this college. I'm going to see that college. Right. I know I'm yeah. going to see this guy there. Yep. So a lot of times certain players, especially if they get a, a certain uh, a tag on them where the AAU program will say high academic threes, you need to be on this kid. Well, now any high academic Oof, three, yeah, they better yeah. be doing their job. They better be on that kid. Do you work? Uh, do you work at the Ivy camps? I do. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great, that's where Drew got, that's where my son got seen. Yeah, that, that's a great, because it's a trickle down. Like, 100%. The Ivies have become. I, we have a committed player yeah. in upcoming class that I saw at Yale camp. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I tell them, I tell the kids too, the ones I've talked to too, I say, just get to a, you don't have to go to all of them. Most, mm-hmm. most of the coaches, right? Yeah, the same guys that you go to the Dartmouth one, you go to the, uh, you know, whatever one. Yeah. They're the same guys, you know. Drew saw, Drew had the Colby guy on him. Um, and I think he, I don't remember which camp, but eventually it was, he ended up on his team at the Dartmouth. But anyway, it's, yeah, yeah. 
Um, That's how it happens. Same faces at the same places. Exactly. It is. Um, so uh, side note, uh, do you guys go after prep school kids? So that's that's part of what's the new uh, recruiting landscape now is in the past, that would not have been our target at all. Uh, Coach Goldsmith, who in his, I think he just finished his eighth year, has had tremendous success at TCNJ, especially when you compare it relative to what the 25, 30 years were prior. Uh, won a conference championship in 2020, won the first round of the NCAA tournament over Marietta, who was number six in the country at the time. So we've had a number of pros and all Americans over the last couple of seasons. But, and that's all been from recruiting high school players and developing them for four years and, right. and all of that. But COVID changed a lot. The, the transfer portal changed a lot. High school players that in the past may have been scholarship level athletes at the time now go prep before they do that. There's just been a shift and we are more open now than we would have been in the past to those types of players. With I think for the high kids. academic kids, this is having talked to my son, who's a sophomore, he goes, and he, he just turned 21. He's a sophomore. He took a gap year rather than yeah. a prep, prep year. And he goes, all my friends are my age. Like yeah. they're all like, they, this kid came from this prep school. This kid came from yeah. this prep. I mean, they obviously, you know, he has a friend who came from the Bay Area and went to a public school. But he goes, I bet two thirds of Middlebury's thing is prep school kids, and they're older, so they're more right. mature. It's like a that's red exactly shirt year. It. Yeah, that's what I was. That's what ultimately what I think that is. Whether or not it's said, what we're ultimately seeing is when the people that high school athletes used to be uh, competing against were other high school athletes. That's changed now. So the transfer portal makes it attractive for colleges to pick a player that has had three years of strength and conditioning coach in college and played in college and is older and more mature and body is more developed. And a prep school kid has one year or maybe two, whatever it is, to try to catch up to that. Right. But right. it makes it even more difficult for a current high school athlete to be as enticing because you're no longer just being evaluated compared to your age peers or your high school peers, you're in a pool of a lot of different players. Of men. You're in a pool of men. Of like when my son graduated, he was a boy still at 18. Yeah. Physically a boy. Now he's at like, holy crap. Because he's been lifting, he's gotten stronger. He's like, it's, yeah, it's, it's boys versus it, men. Like, holy absolutely. Crap. Absolutely. <laughs> and that's that's a big difference. So for us, a prep, I mean, we we are going to consider it now more so than what we probably would have three years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's an interesting, um, is there a moment in your career, success, failure that another coach could learn from? Uh, it, it, I don't, it, it's, it's interesting. Cause I wouldn't want to like bring up the exact same thing again, but it's, it's helped me going forward. So I even use it it's the applying to 60 or whatever amount of jobs on hoop dirt moment. It was when I just went, I'm all in. That was when I knew I was all in was how many, I, I treated it like a full-time job. I was up from about nine to five and that was going to be my thing. I took a lunch break, but I was applying to jobs. That was my day. And when I finally got the opportunity and it, act, I still grasp onto that feeling of that summer of what that felt like and how desperate I was to get into it that I can tap into that, that desperation. I can tap into that desire and the passion that I had to even just be considered at that time. So uh, I hear just, I, I really, I do. I hear a lot of college coaches or people that talk about what I do and they call it a grind. And I've worked so many other jobs in my life that I've never approached this like it's a grind. Is it time consuming? Yes. Do I not have the same social life that I used to, but I don't, but that was a choice. That was something right. that I knew going in, but I also get to have a ton of fun with young people that we share the exact same interests and it's the most interesting personalities and it keeps me young in shape, learning all the time. I, I just don't look at it like a grind and I feel like I can have that perspective because I also have the perspective of the desperation of wanting it so bad wanting oh, it. and then what i tell people too you know it's the thing like i've like I, I i'm a teacher and a basketball coach i love both of them and i've never gone to work a day in my life 
right. ever, never gone to work a day in life. I said, I know when it's two 30 and I just spent the last 45 minutes watching film two 30 <laughs> in the morning. I like, <laughs> yes. Shit, I got to get up at seven. I got to go to bed. I don't want to go to bed, but I got to go to bed. Um, I was doing that the other night. I was freaking, I'm still watching film. And it's like, I gotta, it's, it was one and I go, I got to go to bed. Like, I'm not tired, but I got to go to bed because I know I'll be tired in the morning. And yep. it's like, that's when, you know, it's not a job. It's not like, I'm not looking at it as like, oh crap, you know, um, it's fun like this. I like doing this. So it's like, I yeah. do it. It's like, I'm old. I, well, I'm going to do what I like to do. And, but yeah. that, that's what I tell the young guys. Cause if it's a grind and you don't want to go in and open the gym up, like as a high school coach, if you don't want to go out and do that in the middle of July when you know then that ain't it then then it's a grind then that ain't yeah, for you right you know right right you, you maybe can, be an assistant the rest of your life or be a freshman yeah. coach that's great you can just do that part-time and you won't but if you yeah. want to lead the ship or, or do it at the collegiate level you better be all in or you ain't gonna win and it's gonna be even more miserable at least it's winning true. solves some of it yeah it's true you know i'm fortunate to be around young coaches graduate assistant coaches and i got into this a little bit later than what a typical graduate assistant does. And a lot of times the advice that I give to them is uh, if you want to do the job right, there's a certain way to do it. And it's going to take this commitment to something that can only be replicated in what your playing days were when you were at your craziest trying to develop. If you can tap into that same mentality of getting reps in, recruiting every day, whether it's a text message, email, or actually going to a game, but being on it every day and making sure that you are opening up the gym for that player, whether it is early in the morning or late at night and you had a long day, none of that can matter. You have to give yourself up to something bigger than you, just like you did as a player. And when a lot of people buy into that same mentality, then you can move proverbial mountains as a program. As you, a can, you can. So I have a question about recruiting. So how many, okay, so you're recruiting, D3 is a little different. So you're going to recruit uh if i can 24s five and i'm gonna recruit 24s right now and i have and i don't have a window like there i'm not i'm not hamstrung by a period by dead live quiet so i get to be out and about whenever i want right and, and you're recruiting 24s that's it we are. you're not worried uh, about yeah we're still i mean we're still wrapping up 23s to be you know at this point but we are recruiting 24s we'll look at 25 we'll get an early list you're getting early less. Okay. Yeah. So you're saying that's what, this is where the question comes in. So you're saying you're looking at them and you're making context. And again, D3 is different rules, but yeah. do you, I mean, how do you keep track of this? Like I texted this kid on Tuesday. Yeah. You're not going to text them Tuesday night, Tuesday morning. I mean, there's gotta be some, there has to be, I'm a, again, a stats teacher. You don't want it random, but you also don't want to over. Right. Hey coach, I uh, hope you're liking the video. If you are, subscribe down below. That would be awesome. Um, that will help us uh, get noticed all over the web. Also, make sure you subscribe and hit that little bell up above. You get a notification when we put a new video up every day. That's good. Also, make sure you go over and check out teachhoops.com for coaches who want to get better. Overdo it. You like, got how do you it. keep it's, track of that? You got it. I mean, what you touched on is where recruiting is an art and a science, right? It's not there. There has to be... Um, some type of paint by numbers, mathematical, like make sure we are communicating X with this person. And there's usually a, a, a rhythm to it, right? Make contact, get transcript, get visit, et cetera. But it's also an art and different, uh, and different people are different people. So me talking to one family, they might be more interested in one step before the other step. So it's, it's a wide ranging way of doing things. How do we keep track of it? as organized as we can possibly be and it's something that i still strive to be better at all the time it is a lot sometimes in a day there isn't a window of time it's not business hours so i will get texts from recruits late it might be really early so sometimes my brain is not in operational mode and is, it, and is there a software is there something like synergy like i know synergy for tapes and stuff is there right, something we, you guys we, use we prefer to put our own thing and we have like a document that anybody can access we have categories within it you know and some of it does say like text like have we texted this person just so we know so that it's just putting a y in there as a yes when we did uh did they visit did we see them live and then that'll have their general info their gpa uh what they might be interested in 
when I'm really on my game and I'm updating everything, we have links to their highlight tapes, to their huddle right. in there. Because right. if you're talking to them, you can pull that up and look at exactly. it. Yeah. And exactly. I was, I saw them at this or I saw them at that. Yeah. So the way that we keep track of it is, as I guess the best way I could put it is as best I can. Yeah. A lot of times things do get lost in the sauce. Uh, a joke that I'll tell recruits is the best way to contact me is a lot. Because a lot of times I'm I'm going to forget. Like, I want to respond to your email. I might even have a draft of it. But if a player knocks on the door at that time and I got to go down to the gym to open up the gym for them, and then I'm down there and I'm talking to three different guys for 25 minutes and I get – there's going to be things in my day. It's not a typical office day, you know, on a day-to-day basis. So I try my best, but even a second email or a DM or a text, whatever it is, that's probably going to be – something that a lot of us it reminds you it reminds you what um, yeah. isn't there a like isn't there like a hoop mountain or something something mountain something that has like some elite camps for just like smart kids isn't there a couple there, of those yeah, around there are like um uh there are all academic camps there are like very specific for high academic type of kids they replicate just like the ivies without it being you visiting the ivy camp and playing in front of the staff but you're going to attract a lot of high academic coaches all in the same region to region. the same gyms. So there, there are tailor-made events. Uh, even uh, the company I referenced before, Hoop Group, they'll do elite camps in the summer and academic elite. Okay. Yeah. And that'll get different recruiting. In. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, there's, I, yeah that's I, you know, if there's a niche, somebody will figure it out. Trust somebody me. Somebody will find it. You got They'll it. They'll right find now. it there. Um, so – is is how you run practice in the high school and the college different? And what would what would you say similarities and differences are? Um, I think that in college you're going to be a little bit, I don't want to say more regimented. You're going to be tailor made to what your goals are. So for a college practice in in uh, in conference play, for instance, I think that in my experience, at least, and again, I was coaching with somebody that wasn't as into the X's and O's. But in my both of the colleges that I've been at that I've coached at and even the one that I played for, um, walkthroughs of, of opponent sets, getting a little bit more detailed into the film work of individuals that you're going up against. Uh, a lot of times you're you're just getting into the weeds a little bit more. We have more opportunity to have those times, you know, where we don't have to teach during our day necessarily. Maybe some coaches do. I've I've done that as well. But if we're spending our hours wisely, we're going to have a lot of extra time in the film and in those things to get into those weeds. And one thing I always say, and it's what I tell high school athletes too, is like you might play against an opponent that's really high level and they'll have like five college level kids on that team, or they might have four or three or whatever it is. When you play against a college team, they have 15. And they all right. Every one of them was the best player on their team. they They got all the accolades. They got all of that. So we, I think that what I've noticed is the finer details about tendencies, plays and sets that the other coaches are running, getting calls. Those are the things that I've enjoyed like diving into a little bit more is not just this is a fast team that wants to play up tempo and do that. And I think there are actually a lot of high school coaches out there that do those college level things. Wonderful it is. It helps kids get yeah, ready for that. It does. Season. It yeah. does. We we do that. We do that in ours. We do as many film sessions and breakdowns yeah. and walkthroughs and the morning of a game because I just think it's better for them to have totally. seen it in my environment than in other ones. But it's just I I don't know. I just think it it's not that hard. It again, it takes work though. If you want to be good, I don't know. I I find winning more fun than losing. So. <laughs> Oh, couldn't agree more. And I think that I think what I what I would say is from coaching at the high school that I was at, a really small public school with no resources and no funding, uh, we did we just we didn't we wouldn't have been able to. We just would not have been able to get it done at the level that we would have wanted to. We worked with what we had, and we were limited in those capacities. We also had a we were not necessarily the time, but it was close to a majority minority. Uh, population due to being real close to New York, sometimes we had guys coming in that English was their second language. So we were also learning to communicate with them just in general before we could even get into right. the weeds. Yeah. The well, and the thing is, it's like, I'm going to tell coaches that are listening to this, you got to be creative too. Like if you don't have the resources, 
shoot, I used to write out my hand. I used to hand write my uh, uh, scouting reports and I used to have two VCRs and sit like, I mean, I didn't have the money for the fancy little like whatever. And then, you know, so um, I'm that old. I went from VCRs to DVD. I bought it. I have a DVD burner over there. I used to use. Yep. So yep. It's like, absolutely. You can make it work if you want, right. but it's just going to take more work. Yes. Um, and again, I, it's, I, I don't know. I just find it more fun to win. I'm going to do whatever I can <laughs> do. I'm going to do whatever I can do to win. I am, I'm with you on that. Coach. You know, as long as it's legal and it's not like unsportsmanlike, right. I'm going to, we're going to like, yeah, we're going to be, it's, it. it's the secret sauce. It's hard work. It's it is. Out. So we're I'll tell you, my, my brother runs a VC company, one of the most active ones in the entire country. So very, Lots of people anyway. Mm -hmm. And I always ask him, you know, when you're interviewing guys for, 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 for the venture capital and to come in and, you know, he, he obviously looks at resumes and stuff. I said, if he goes, if I have two equal guys, I'll take the little less smart guy that work, outworks the smart guy. Yeah. You know, cause you want the person that's going to grind. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. They'll, they'll, they might've spent 20 hours to get what the other, the smart guy should have gotten done in 12, but he'll get right. it done better. Right. Like, okay. Whatever. It don't matter as long as the job gets done. Um, yep. All right. I'm going to go through. I always, so this is, I call this rapid fire. I'm going to ask you some questions. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, they're just, they're going to be, uh, we'll go from one to one. They'll, some will be long, some will be short. What is okay. your favorite brand of basketball, the actual ball you play with? Yeah. So I actually have it in my hands. It's a Wilson Evolution. We don't use this that we play, uh, that we play with. Um, but forever, this is the high school ball that I play with. So Wilson Evolution, hands down. And why? And it's the grit. I just, for me, like I'm a, I'm a shooter in general. You give me a rock, but this is the one that it's the most natural for me. I know we use Spalding TF thousands because that's yeah. when they use the state tournament. But the, but the leather is like I gotta talk awesome. to somebody. It's Spalding. It's not oh. the grip isn't there. I, I mean, do I'm like the wide. I do like the wide channels. Um, yeah. one word to describe your ideal player. Gritty. Okay, you go to one sporting event in the world, I'll pay for it. What would you go to? World Cup. That's a great call. I don't have a lot of World Cups. World Cup, yep. Uh, yep. Trust me, I've been in Europe during the World Cup. Yeah. It is, yeah. like, people have no That's idea. Right. <laughs> That's like, what I want. Like, yeah. we were, like, <laughs> I was with my brother. We were going, we were, we were backpacking through Europe, and, like, okay, it was in Italy at the time. I think it must have been 90. Anyway, mm -hmm. and, um. And we were going to go to Florence, and the people said, you're not going to Florence. <laughs> because they were playing it was a World Cup game. So we jumped on a train and went to Milan. I don't know. We went somewhere else. Right, right. It was like, yeah, these mm. people are crazy. Do you yeah, have I would want to experience that. Yeah, it, it, it's pretty cool. Uh, U.S., isn't it, in four? I think Soon. so, yeah. Soon. Yep. It'll be interesting if it gets that crazy here. Right, right. That's a different world. We'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. Well, we'll, we'll hope. We can hope. Uh, yeah. Favorite pregame meal or postgame meal? Uh, peanut butter and jelly pregame meal, postgame meal would be Philly cheesesteak. Oh, you live in the right spot for that. Uh, mm -hmm. What does your game day look like as a college coach? Game day for us, we would play on a Wednesday at night or a Saturday. I'll use a Saturday. I'm up. At, I'm up early. I'm getting to the to the office early. I want to make sure that every single detail on the scouting report is good, that all my game day sheets on the notes that I'm going to take are good. We're going to do a pregame shoot around. Um, so we'll do the shoot around early in the day. Then I'm going to go home for a little bit, have some lunch, take a shower, get all my stuff ready for, uh, I'm going to give myself a home game in this scenario. Okay. And get, get back over to the gym. The women usually play before us. So I'll get there and watch typically right at the end of the first quarter. And, uh, an hour out from game time is when my brain switches into blocking everything else out mode. And, and what, and what does, does, and who does your, who does the, who are you or your sister? Who does the uniforms and all the behind the scenes stuff? Yeah, we have equipment. We have equipment. Okay. So the equipment. Staff and, and game day um, operations, they're excellent where I am right now. Okay. So. That's really good that you're not having to yeah. do any of the equipment manager takes no. care of that. It's nice. No, they're, yeah. They are high level. Yeah. That's <laughs> one thing you do to relax. Oof. Watch NBA. Instead. Cause I, I hardly get to watch like that. And to me, it's like not even 
it's so different than what I'm used to and trying to analyze and do all that. It's so much more entertainment based. And since I don't really have any dogs in the fight anymore, I just kind of, it's, it's relaxing. They're, cra they're crazy. They're just so insanely talented. It's, it's like watching a sport in my mind. Yeah. Like obviously Wisconsin and the Bucks and Giannis, yeah. if you see him, like yeah. that would be me on a computer building a basketball player. Like that's just, you should just not be like that. Like and then I want to, I, I want to give a non-basketball answer. I'm just, it's actually harder to find for me. Uh, but what I, what I love to do, I have a, a small circle of friends and my two best friends, each of them just had their first children, each is a baby girl. So one thing I've been trying to do as often as I can is uh, go up and see them and see their, the wives and their new babies. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. That's been a nice change of pace. Yeah, babies smell really good. That's they, <laughs> yeah, really do. Yeah. they do smell yeah. good. They do smell good. Uh, do you have any superstitions? Uh, game day is uh, just the the pattern in which I get dressed is somewhat superstitious, but I've been involved in enough um, losing seasons in my life that I've also learned that my socks don't really matter. No, it's yeah. routine. I tell yeah. people it's routine. It's not superstition. It's routine. Um, all right, here's a tough one again. Describe your perfect player in five words. Okay. I'm going to take one second here to really think about it. Gritty, skilled, smart, competitive, and crazy. Yeah, that's what you're looking for in a recruit yeah. right there. That's what you're looking for. Yeah. Uh, best basketball player you have seen in person? LeBron at ABC. No, uh, it was Lenny Cook at ABCD, to be honest with you. Lenny Cook at ABCD camp. ABCD camp used to be held at the Rothman Center, which is where FDU played. And that was top high school athletes in the country uh, would come to play there. And that was yeah. around the corner from where I grew up. So I got to see some of the best ones. I saw Steph. Steph on Marbury, I should say. I dated myself there. But I went to I went to five star, I went to five star and blue chip. That was a different era. Yeah. And uh seeing Lenny Cook, it's a, even though he didn't really have the career that panned out, Eddie Curry was so incredibly dominant when he was in high school and when he was playing against other high school athletes, he was just a man among boys. So that was another super impressive one. And Sebastian Telfair was the best point guard that I ever really saw live, like in person uh, at that time as, as a high school player. Uh, best player of all time. Best player of all time is to me, it's Michael. Uh, I just don't, at this point, uh, LeBron is the best career of all time, I would say, but best player. Well, uh, just my eyes and, and how I enjoyed the game. It was Michael. He never lost the finals. Yeah. Let's be, yeah, I mean, greatest winner. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if you could only teach one basketball skill, what would you teach? Shooting. Okay. If you would change one thing about basketball, what would you change? I want uh, college games to be four quarters instead of two halves. Oh, that's good. I think my, you know, what, my utopian, there's two get rid of the jump ball. Mm. It's stupid. It is stupid. Yeah. Agree. Because at the high school level, it's even worse because they can't throw it up. Right. And the second thing is the college court and the and the um, NBA court need to get wider. Oh, oh, couldn't agree more. I mean, the athletes are showing us that. I, I mean, anything. I mean, I mean, I, I, I have D one guy. Our league has four yeah. or five D one guys every year. It's too small. They, for them. It, it's too small. It's it's actually league. dangerous. Yeah. It is dangerous. It's, it's dangerous. Not... I we're seeing high impact collisions and all of these things because we don't have deceleration time behind the basket. Uh, they're going. They don't even reach, they don't even have enough space to reach max speed. So the deceleration from going is so difficult. I think that's why we see joint injuries and things like that. So what I would do is I would go 160, I think, for a new court. Mm. Yeah. Because it's 94, it. 54. I'd go, right. I think I'd go 60. 100. That, yeah. length yeah. Make, it, make it a little longer if we're going to do yeah. it. If we're going to change the court, let's make it. And then. I, I would love if like an overtime elite or, or some type of ancillary league tried it out. Right. We can get some data and just yeah. see what it looked like. Yeah. Yeah. And then I, and then we got to change the charge. I don't know how yeah. we change I've, it. Like you can't. Agree. It's dangerous. Especially another, at that level. Dangerous thing. Right. Because we're seeing, again, we're seeing the, the high impact, the, the athleticism is just at a level that is incredible. It's super fun, but it is dangerous. They're going to hire people to just come in and take a charge on Giannis. Right. And the guy's worth a hundred million. Don't come on. 
Like, right. you're not going to, you're not going to, you're not going to, th- you're not going to make Elvis, you know, try to sing yeah. in a pool, you know? And, like- uh, and, w- and one thing I would say, I mean, especially in New Jersey, I, I don't know what the deal is in Wisconsin or not, but uh, shot clock in high school, I get it. I really would love it coming from the school that I came from, unless the state paid for it. There was no way that that was ever going to get put up in, 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 uh, in the schools without the funding. If you have to hire an additional shot clock op, I'm fully aware of the funding issues that would be involved with that. And that's why I get it. I get why it's not. But if there was any way, I don't care if it's a, a, a somebody on the sideline with a, a wristwatch just yelling out. The only run, run. And, and, and again, I don't really care. I always seek the other side just to cause Twitter problems. <laughs> I think, yeah. To be honest with you. But the only issue I have is what's unique about high school basketball, why I love it and why I haven't made the jump and have had opportunities to do it is every every season i get a new bunch of kids and i've had teams where we're going to be in the 90s i've had teams where we're going to be in the 40s and we're going to win both ways Mm -hmm. because i'm going to change to what my guys the problem i have is i think that it's going to become very vanilla the same everyone's going to kind of do the same thing because of the shot clock Mm. and you know, if you make it 40 or something, fine, but whatever. I, I just think it's going to, everyone's going to go to a two, two pressure and because high right. school that we don't have the abilities, our range of abilities is so wide Yeah, yeah. that it's like, I mean, that's my for me, it, for me, it's selfish. I want my freshmen to just be more ready to do what we do. Yeah, I so know. I, well, I, I just, get it. And, and yeah. the problem is that as the players get better, like no one presses in college basketball anymore. Really? It's so rare. It's, it's, it's not gimmicky. It's, it's different. You, it's something that you have to like totally in the college level, you have to have principles with it, totally buy into it. It's gotta be like a well thought out way to go about it. My and why is that? that? Cause yeah. I'm telling you, Kentucky was doing that all that because the players weren't, I'm just yeah that's my worry it's like all that stuff would disappear from high school Mm -hmm. like god i gotta prepare for this team runs a one three one this team runs a diamond and one this team runs a two two one i'm i this team runs you know dribble drive this team's running flex if you can believe it oh i believe it's unbelievable it's when i see flex in aau it blows my mind i know and it works i mean it it does put a back screen it, it does if you leave if they screen but that's my only issue is like i don't want that's my only concern i don't know if that would happen mm-hmm. but that's my only concern is like god everyone's gonna look exactly the same yeah they're gonna run the same ball screen when there's seven seconds on the shot clock <laughs> same flat ball screen in the middle yes yeah. it's gonna be that's and when you go to high school you watch enough high school games because you that it's not that right now you get it's not i think i guess my counter to it would be the ones that can get creative will be the ones that separate the they coaches that the they coaches will. that can look at it the same way we do. Oh, which, I think it would be good for our program because we'll pivot. You guys, if you have the talent, and that's the thing, it, it might yeah. play to your advantage if you already have players that are talented enough. I think it exposes guys that can create a shot off the dribble. I think that it exposes teams that can execute a screen correctly and create a disadvantage scenario. And it exposes the teams that are unable to when a, when their initial set breaks down, go to plan B, go to plan C, or get it into the hands of somebody that can just go to plan Z. I would play, I would spend a lot more time on ball screens if that happens. Yeah. And because we just literally what we do is we just switch ball screens. Now, different opponents yes. will change. We just switch everything. Yeah. Like, we just switch everything because there's no, there's no gray area. I don't right. know. And that, that does replicate where the college game is going, especially because we're all copy pasting off the NBA right. one way or another. Yeah. And um, I just switch everything because literally what I like to spend 30 minutes of a practice talking about how to read screens and are we going to have ice or I would love to, I don't have time to do that. Literally. Exactly. You know, so that's I, where that is one of those aspects, which goes back to another question you had, like the difference is, we might spend a good portion of practice on the rotations off of an ice blitz because right. we're going right. into that team and yeah. we see that yeah. they want to run wing ball screens. We get to get that opportunity to go in while at the same time having, you know, basic principles like this past season, we were pack line oriented. So right. all of our right. decisions were going to come from a pack line mindset and we were going to be making ball screen reads out of that. Um, but it's, it's an element of, of where I think the game is going of the offensive ability to just create like the guards you can they're getting even more positionless 
even point guards are kind of blending into just guards. Right. More or less. Guys that can create. That is where the game is. Well, you look at you look at look at Shaquille O'Neal. He's like number seven all time in the NBA scoring. Yeah. I mean, him and Wilt would both be in the top three if they could have shot free throws in their career. But right. anyway, those guys are good players now, but they're not them because everyone wants this. I mean, that's why Steph, first of all, Steph changed the game more than any human being in the last 20 years because of his ability to shoot threes. He's, he, every kid wants to be that. Yeah. But, but uh, you know, he's a, he's 6'3", and he looks tiny out there. Yes. They want the they want the guy that can play two, three, four. Yes. All the time. Yes. Know? I mean, I, I when I go to when I go to AU events and I'm just fishing, I'm just looking, I'm dreaming of my six five point guard. Yeah. I want a six five point guard yeah. that can pass the ball, that can create off the bounce, that can shoot behind the ball screen. So you can't go under on him. Now you gotta go over. And now he's playing two on one against that bit. It's where the game is going. So I have, it's difficult for me. I was recruiting a six, five point guard actually out of New Jersey and that shot clock situation. It's like, I want to evaluate you and see what you can do, but that team is playing like a three, two zone and they're just doubling every single time you get it. And right. there's no right. counters to that. And it's going to be a difficult uh, arena to do a proper evaluation in, but it's the nature of the game. There are both is, coaches are coaching to the rules of the game yeah. and there's no yeah. blame involved, yeah. but yeah. it would be one thing that I would force the shot clock and just it, it helps the evaluation. It's process. eventually it's gonna happy. come. It's eventually. Yeah, gonna come. yeah. The game's it's going just, that way. It's just, right. it's just when. I mean, right. yeah, I'll be sitting on a beach drinking a margarita <laughs> by that. Point. Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, does it sound good? Yeah, it sound good. All right. Uh, do you have a favorite quote or saying? I mean, it's so it, it'll be in context. One of the things that we talk about in our program is uh is e plus r equals o which is event plus response equals the outcome and it's a mentality that i try to like have just in general life philosophy is the outcome of something that occurs has your response baked in to the recipe of what right. that outcome is going to be it's not just the event and you know we use basketball as a metaphor as coaches we use it as a metaphor for life you play it for us, it's 40 minutes. And in those 40 minutes, you are guaranteed to face adversity in one way or another. Right. Your response to that is going to be a major portion of what the outcome of this day, this event, this game, that set, that, that possession is. So when you expand that into other arenas and other experiences in life, it can make a more boiling moment into a calmer moment if you kind of remember like I actually get to impact how I'm going to feel about this if I could catch myself in that moment and just give myself that opportunity to affect this outcome by having a better mindset towards something um, so it's it's an approach to failure I think this is all general it's one of the greatest pieces of pieces of advice that my high school coach Jay Mahoney gave to me as a player which was that failure is going to be an inevitable companion in your process to where you're going. Your relationship with failure is going to be a major factor in how far you get to go. Boom. I'm telling you, like, yeah, me, my, again, my brother runs the, the mo one of the most active venture capitals in the, I can tell you how many companies he started and they, that one didn't work. And he, he pivot. You, yeah. you, boop, 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 you know, eventually you're going to find something that works. Um, best basketball coach of all time. My bias would be my high school coach, but in general, and this is really putting myself in my region, is Bob Hurley from St. Anthony's, Hall of Fame coach. The great, I, I used to go to Bob Hurley week at Pocono Invitational when they had that. I've watched him coach games. I've seen him run practices. That is, from my eyes and my ears and the energy that I've been around, is the greatest coach I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, St. Anthony's got a, like, they should, yeah. And that doesn't even exist anymore, right? No, it went defunct, yeah. That was a really, like, the, as low budget as you could even imagine type of school. They stayed alive forever off of donors. and Off of him, probably. Energy. Yeah, yes. exactly. His connections and whatnot, yep. Um, one book you'd recommend? Legacy. It's about the New Zealand All Blacks. Uh, I'm blanking on the author oh, right now. Yeah, 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 Legacy. yeah, yeah. 
legacy. I, okay, I, th- I always ask that for me. You, um, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, re- I'm gonna put that in my audible. Oh, so um, good. Yeah. Okay, uh, I gotta just make sure I got all of these clues. Um, all right. So I always end with this question: hmm. What would be one bit of advice you'd give your 18 year old self? Uh, the the piece of advice that I would give my 18 year old self is um, be more present, just be more present. And like the moments that I was in uh, all of them, the bus rides that I had with teammates um, losses, uh, the locker rooms after when coach was talking, like all of those things now that I'm on the other end and I, I like wish I could, grab my players and tell them to appreciate these moments. I remember we had a graduating senior this year who was about to go into coaching. And it was one random day in practice that I went up to him while he was doing a stretching routine. And I said, write down your stretching routine. Memorize it if you have to. But one day you're going to be 26, 27. You're going to be going play pickup. If you do the same routine, it'll bring you right back. To this moment. It'll bring you back to what it felt like when you were playing because it'll replicate that same way you prepared but it'll, it'll snap, like be a photograph of that moment. But I enjoyed playing so much and I enjoyed all of it that I would just dare myself to, to be more present in everything going forward. That's a great life lesson too. You know, people it's just, you, you lose the moments. Like, shoot, my daughter's going off to college. We're going to be empty nesters. It's like, oh my God, it was like yesterday they were crawling around the house. So right. I know, I love that. Well, thank you, coach. I appreciate it. I know this is busy but, season, time of year for you. Yeah, I, yeah. Appreciate, I appreciate you finding some time to do this. So no, my you. pleasure. I really appreciate you having me. This was a lot of fun. fun. Thanks for watching, coach. Make sure you go over and check out teachhoops.com for coaches who want to get better. Make sure you subscribe so you get notified every time we come back on. But you will not be disappointed with teachhoops.com. 14-day free trial. Let's go check it out. Have a great day.